right, welcome to the Queen City Soccer Show. I'm Level Up Luke, and I am joined today by the Chief Fan Officer of Charlotte FC, Mr. Sean McIntosh. How are you, Sean? I'm doing wonderful, uh, Luke. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, man. So I got to ask you, as far as a Chief Fan Officer, th that was a new position title for me. I, I had never heard of that before. Uh, you got fan in the name, but you're paid by the club. Can you tell me a little bit about what a Chief Fan Officer does? Yeah, um, yeah. I'll, I'll start off by telling you what it's not. Um, it is. It is not uh, a paid cheerleader, a paid supporter. Um, you know, I, I've seen um, you know folks take confusion to it and and think that it's um it's like an influencer or um one of those contests I've seen, uh, you know, as, as like a, a fan of the club that's again, being paid, you know, my role is, is unique in that, you know, my responsibility is to one, maintain a, a strong pulse of, of fan sentiment and work collaborate with, with all of our fans. Um, certainly a, a large part of that is um, working with our supporters on, you know, building out what the the match day experience looks like, and and really just across the club, making sure that there is a, a voice inside of each department. And so it's my responsibility to listen to what fans are saying, hearing, and uh, and bringing that back to you know each segment of the club, whether that's the marketing department, ticket sales, um, you know, sporting side to. Uh, to you name it. So um, it's an interesting role. And, and, you know, I work cross collaboratively uh, uh, with everybody at the club and, you know, certainly ensure that um, that I'm listening and hearing and talking and engaging with fans like yourself on podcasts and taking a lot of what I hear back um, to the club. So, you know, we can, we can do better and make sure that uh, we are a club for, for its fans. So um, it's a responsibility I don't take lightly. That's awesome. And we can certainly point to Charlotte FC as uh, one of the clubs that I think is most engaged with fans. How much do you think you play a role in that? And going into year three, what have some of your biggest successes been in the role? I'd like to think I, I play a, a big part in that. Um, you know, I, I think particularly when it comes to the relationship with our supporters, um, I, I'd say that's certainly something I take a lot of pride in, uh, in, I would, I would mark as one of our biggest successes as a club, you know, when I, you know, and I, and I've been involved in the sport my entire life and it's been an important part of, of who I am as, as an individual personally. And so um, certainly understanding the sport, the culture, it's fans, uh, it plays a part in that, but, you know, I, I, I made it pretty clear early on with a, with a number of our, supporters that are in leadership roles with their groups. You know, I, I had the opportunity to, to travel to uh, clubs and teams across this country globally um, early on in my tenure in particular. And I, I was able to take a couple supporters with me on some of those trips and build relationships. And, you know, we were able to see some of the cool things that other teams do. And, and as we were sort of mapping out and trying to envision what we wanted to do as as a club and as supporters and some of the traditions and what do we want to do in the, in the building on match days, you know, I started to learn about maybe some of the struggles other MLS clubs in particular have with their supporters. And you know, I'll be honest, a lot of times it's just, it's silly, you know, it, and it's, it, it, um, so I made it pretty clear that myself as, as somebody who loves this sport dearly and loves this club and no different than, than a supporter in that we both want the same thing. We want this club to succeed. We want to do cool shit, you know, and, and, and we will to look be looked upon across the globe as, as one of the best clubs in the world. And so, you know, whether an idea comes from a fan, uh, whether it comes from a premium seat holder, whether it comes from a supporter, whether it comes from me or someone at the club, like, Let's not be one of those um, club supporter relationship that, you know, is, is just so focused on the, where the idea came from and, and, and let's just work together on do on doing some really cool things. And, you know, I, my, my promise to supporters is that I was going to do everything to help make things happen for them. I was going to be as transparent as possible 
and and I was going to provide a line of communication, you know, twenty four seven, as long as as we work together and kept those lines of communications open. And I like to think that I'm I'm pretty responsive, particularly on social media, to give fans an avenue. Um, so you know, I, I think that was um, something that that has been really unique. Because again, there are a lot of clubs that just that don't have that with their supporters um, and fans. So I think we've been able to accomplish a, a few things that I'm really proud of. You know, I, I think we do have an incredible match day experience. You know, and that that goes um, in part to to the hard work that our supporters put in. And you know, I just try to provide them opportunities and access and and help when it comes to navigating our stadium and, and what we can and can't do and, and helping get things pushed over the finish line and, um, you know, helping them and in, in, in the creative process of just things that we might like to do and, and some things that have been some hits um, that have become staples in our stadium on match day. And so, um, you know, when I look back at, at, you know, thinking about even just this past home opener, um, I read every single survey. So we send out a survey to fans uh, post-match and I read every single comment um, in that and, you know, take a lot of pride in, in making sure that we can get better. And uh, but certainly, you know, also take a lot of pride in, in when people have never been to a soccer match ever and they're walking away, blown away um, by the sport, by this club and wanting to come back. So I think that's always a, a something that I find as a big success. Yeah, man, uh, that's fantastic. And like you said, the match day experience is uh, absolutely at the top of MLS, in my opinion. Uh, there's maybe one or two other clubs who could say that they offer uh, or that the supporter groups provide such an atmosphere. Um, but like you said, we can always get better. And I'm sure when you're reading those surveys after the games, those are mostly positive comments, right? Yeah, always. That's all I ever hear is positive comments. What are some of the uh, craziest feedback uh, that you've that you've gotten? You know, I don't. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. Like sometimes fans just don't know, right? So, like um, one of the biggest critiques that we got for the first two years, and this isn't one that's crazy. I, I did have one that was kind of blew my mind. Um, but, uh, and, and maybe I'll share that. Um, but, uh, there was, you know, for the first couple of years, just thinking about things like, uh, stoppage time and, and oh, yeah. fans just kind of berating us and, and wanting us to have stoppage time. And like, we all, we all wanted that. Like that wasn't yeah. like a, Oh, the club is not doing something so <laughs> obvious as, as not showing stoppage time. That was purely like something league wide FIFA wide that right. you can not do. And, and that was merely to, you know, protect, protect the refs, you know, because should a, a goal happen um, after the, the assigned stoppage time, you know, and, and knowing that, you know, when it comes to time in soccer, it's, it, there's a lot of gray area in that. And so um, this year they made changes to it. And so yeah. we saw a lot of positive and I like, like inverse, like I'm not, we're not going to take credit as a club that we came up with this idea to show stoppage time. But a lot of people were saying that in the comments, like, great job. Like finally <laughs> you guys did it. Um, but that was merely, you know, league wide policy and, and no club was, was doing that. Um, so things like that, you know, you, you see things and, and it's always interesting because you'll have, you'll get comments of uh, three comments in a row of, of something people loved. And then the next three people saying that they hated that thing. Um, so it's, it's sometimes it gets tough to, to gauge, but, um, you know, we appreciate it and, and it is important to us because we, we wholeheartedly take that feedback and, and assess it and, uh, and try to find ways to get better. So that's awesome, man. Uh, personally for you coming to Charlotte, uh, I mean, you've, you've been all over the place. Uh, did you grow up mostly on the West coast or where, where are you from originally? So I actually spent most of my life, um, childhood growing up in Italy, um, so my mom's Italian, she was born and raised in, um, in a, in a small town in the Lazio region. Um, and so my dad was American U S Navy. So met my mom overseas and we ended up staying there for about 12 and a half, 13 years of, wow. of childhood, um, kind of bouncing back and forth between the U S and, and Italy. So, uh, moved permanently to the U S when I graduated high school and, um, went straight to, to university. I went to a small private school in West Virginia. My parents uh, relocated to the Virginia Beach area and 
my wife's from Norfolk, Virginia. So you know, about six hours away um, from Charlotte and uh, got into, once I graduated, um, got my master's degree in sports business. And, and from there, my career has been entirely in the professional sports world. So, you know, started off with my, my, my new local hometown. So the Norfolk Admirals, they were an American hockey league team at the time. So, uh, your, your triple a affiliate for the Tampa Bay sure. lightning spent four years there, uh, working, um, you know, minor league sports are wearing a lot of hats. So I was actually responsible. I was uh, left there as their director of uh, game operations. So overseeing all of the match day elements, all of your entertainment pieces, the music that was playing in the building, the um, activations, and also wearing a dual hat uh, role on, on this ticket sales side of things. And you know, then got my first opportunity in major professional sports, moving out West Coast to the Phoenix area to work for the Phoenix Suns and Phoenix Mercury. Uh, spent a couple years there before I, I got to break into major league soccer. And, you know, that's again, the league that I wanted to be in having grown up playing this sport, wanting to be a part of the growth of it. Uh, so had my first leadership opportunity with the Houston dynamo um, spent four years there you know, left as their, their head of ticket sales um, before taking on a, a unique opportunity. No, not too much different than here in Charlotte where I was part of a, a brand new, club uh, working for MGM Resorts International that had owned, um, had bought the WNBA franchise, Las Vegas Aces. Hmm. Um, and so That's, spent so, a couple years there. So it was a pro team owned by a casino brand. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yes, casino brand, obviously known for that, but MGM Resorts, um, you know, they're, they're, they're a major entertainment company. Sure. Uh, obviously own a lot. Most of the Las Vegas Strip, you're, you're thinking MGM Grand, your Bellagio's. Uh, they're in the sports betting world now. MGM. Yeah. Now they've got obviously bet MGM and right. uh, you know, massive, massive company. They own half of um, the building that the uh, Vegas Golden Knights play in at T-Mobile Arena. And so they bought the WNBA franchise from San Antonio, moved it to Las Vegas. Um, so I get to, I got to be a part of a, a brand new uh, team there and um, working for this major conglomerate, um, just understanding a, a different piece of the entertainment side, learning that, um, building up that, you know, incredible brand, which, which I like to think is the best in the WNBA. Um, and, uh, and then had a chance to, to go back to where it all started to actually run uh, the Norfolk Admirals as their CRO and president, overseeing all business operations um, and you know, it was just an interesting story because I had, uh, in between that had been connected with, uh, Charlotte FC about an opportunity, but, uh, but COVID hit and, you know, the club put a freeze on, on all hiring and right. obviously delayed the club, uh, from a 2020, 20, uh, from a 2021 to a 2022, uh, start. And so, um, from, from there, I, I thought it was kind of um, over. And uh, and then they had this opportunity as chief fan officer and, and reached out to some of the folks at the club that I knew and you know, expressed my interest. And it was an absolute fit. And it's where I wanted to be um, for a very long time. So I was happy it all ended up working out. That's uh, it's a quite a journey that you had coming up through the professional sports world. But what was it like coming from Italy, growing up with uh, – you know, one of the top five soccer leagues in the world, arguably probably number one when you were there and then coming to the U S and adapting to the MLS environment. What was that kind of transition like sports wise? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's everything. It's, it's just ingrained in the, into the culture there. So um, I, I was a passionate Serie A fan. Um, my, my hometown club, my family's club is, is Lazio. So um grew up, watching and and obviously um was a big follower of our national team and um it, it just it was it was just something we did he did, didn't even really have a choice um and it was just a part of kind of everyday culture and so um it it, it obviously was different than coming to the u.s where especially at that time i, I moved to the u.s permanently in 2003 um you know the the landscape of the game was just so much different um it was it was so so niche and uh I, even attending university you know not a lot of my friends were soccer fans um but they all love fifa and that was yeah. really where kind of all i remember fifa just really 
growing in popularity um, in that time frame. And so that, that obviously helped grow the game. And obviously the broadcasting rights, the English Premier League doing a really nice job of you know, sinking their claws in into the U.S. market, and um, that yeah, certainly that NBC helped. Coverage. Yeah, and so honestly, it was it was really really cool. But I never, you know, when it came to Major League Soccer, I'll be honest, um, I just always had a club, so I, I didn't necessarily pay a ton of attention to MLS until, like many people, uh, David Beckham came into this league. Oh right, and, yeah, and and you know, again, I, I was a a. a still am to this day, a diehard Lazio fan. So I never really had, never had another European club that I ever uh, cared about, but I was for whatever reason, like many people, a Beckham fan and, uh, and followed his career. And then when he came to major league soccer, it, it gave me a reason to pay attention. And it's like, wow, you know, maybe, maybe there is something here. Maybe the, the Americans have something like, okay, like, let's pay attention and, and definitely pay, paid attention from afar. And um, I latched on to, I, I'd spent some time in the Fort Worth Dallas area when I was in middle school. So that was kind of an all Dallas sports fan. So, okay. um, so, you know, paid attention to the Dallas burn at the time a little bit, but again, never really latched on other than paying attention to some of the players, primarily Beckham. And so um, it's been really cool to see, just the levels this league has taken and right um you know there's there's obviously a, a ton of interesting and goofy mechanism in place for <laughs> you know that that's, that's different that's one way league. of putting it sure <laughs> yeah but look for for all of the nuances that there are with how the rosters are built and how the league is structured oh you know, that's that's how it was able to survive and how it was able to grow. And right. you know, now we've got a league that, I mean, it, you can debate, it's debatable. I mean, it's, it, it is one of the more interesting leagues in the world. You know, it, it, every going into every season, you don't know who MLS cup champ is going to be. And every club yeah. has something to play for. You know, I'll, I'll be honest. The most exhausting argument is, is when people talk about pro rel, um, as if it's, it's the only reason that a league can be interesting. Right. Um, particularly when you hear that from Americans who are so passionate about their other professional teams and there are plenty of narratives. I'm a big NBA fan too. Like there's sure. NBA is interesting as hell and they don't have relegation. Um, you know, and, and not saying that that can't help, but you know, I, I just think, um, watching a, a team run away with a league year in and year out is not that interesting either. So, uh, I, I mean, Hey, most of our European uh, sides are in leagues that uh, are like that, you know, Germany, Italy. I mean, you guys have what two, two to four teams, depending on the year. Um, I, obviously my league has two teams. Uh, England has the big six. Uh, yeah. Spain has two. I, I mean, it's like that in most of the European leagues. Right. Uh, it's the difference in spend and financial fair play has maybe helped a little bit. Maybe not. I mean, I, I don't know. It's still all about. Yeah. I mean, if we're being that. honest, financial fair play is, is a mockery, but that's where, right. right. Like when you think about the structure in place for this league, there, 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 it is like, I, I love to see it where it's fair and balanced for the most part um, where everybody again can come in and, and you've got to be in terms of sporting directors, like, you got to be smart. You you have to know what you're doing um, versus again, some of these teams across the pond, like can just spend their way out of trouble. Yeah. And that still doesn't help when you look at clubs like Chelsea that can spend and spend and spend and spend and, and still can't seem to get out of their own way. So, you know, again, I think um, there's a, there's a lot of things to love. And the, one of the things I love about this sport in, in, the variety of leagues there are is that they all offer something different, um, which makes each one exciting in their own right. Well, Hey, I'm going to uh, take this moment to introduce my co-host Cole Goffrey. Uh, Cole, glad you could join us. I heard you had a little emergency going on over there. I hope everything's okay. Yeah. I had to go get my daughter from school earlier today. She was sick and um, she was, she was sleeping and then she decided to wake up and uh, uh, so yeah. I had to deal with that. And, but we really appreciate you coming on the show, Sean, man. I, I really do appreciate it. 
Well, thanks for having me, Cole. I appreciate it. And, uh, and nice to meet you and hope your daughter's feeling better. Yeah, I hope so too. I think she just got a little stomach bug. I think she'll be all right. Um, yeah, uh, I know. I know. I missed some stuff. I, I come in on the tail end of talking about you know pro rail. Um, where so <laughs> where we're we've talked about that on the show before, but where yeah. where exactly are we at? It's uh well, pro rail is exhausting to deal with, especially with the pro pro rail crowd um, on yeah. Twitter. It's it's ridiculous, but um, I think we'd all love to see pro rail as long as it could work in, in a reasonable manner understanding that we're in a capitalist system and uh kind of an nba and well you know american sports model um and a single entity league so you just got to be logical about it and find a way that it works for everybody um we, we're talking about sean's background coming from italy uh to the united <laughs> states and his background in sport and i want to ask you about the norfolk admirals uh that's ahl right so it was AHL my first stint. They're now in the ECHL, which okay. um, gotcha. you know, now it's, would be one step below the AHL. Gotcha. So I actually covered the Rochester Amherst okay. um, for a season, and I grew up with the Syracuse Crunch. Obviously, we got yep. the Chargers down here. One of the coolest things about minor league hockey is the atmosphere, the game day environment. The promotions are always insane. And the experience of uh, having an affordable game you can go to with the whole family and uh, take part in a sports experience that you're not necessarily watching on TV. If you're not there in person, you're not getting the whole experience. Um, how do you think the hockey game, especially the AHL level, translates over to a completely different environment like Bank of America Stadium, capacity 75,000? What sort of things can you take from hockey and then what things need more adapting and which ones don't apply at all, I guess? Yeah, I think, um, you know, my time in, in minor league, I think, gave me an advantage in a, in a lot of ways. One, because you are forced to, to think creatively, right? Like you don't have a ton of resources. You don't have a massive marketing budget. Uh, you don't have the glitz and glam of, you know, in, in hockey, you're, you don't, you don't have a, 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 a Sidney Crosby. You don't have a Stamkos. Right. You don't have an Ovechkin coming in. Like you don't have, it's not the NBA where you're selling your LeBrons, your Kobe's like um, you're not going to have a Messi coming in. And so it, it truly is about the atmosphere, creating uh, an affordable product, um, building something that uh, that is is a little bit of a, a FOMO experience that is like you got to be there. Again, your most teams don't have TV rights, and so you you really just got to get creative, and that's where a lot of the theme nights and and what you're doing in venue is really important. The giveaways, um, and so that that helped me just to be a little bit more creative, particularly when I took the step into the NBA. I was able to take some of that creativity and. Um, you know, I, I think that does play a, a role. I think for me going back to, you know, prior to our launch, our first match, it was important that we took an approach that was, um, that was like, let's just do awesome stuff. Forget about soccer. I didn't limit myself to traveling to just soccer venues. So, um, I, I went and saw, and I had seen, but I wanted to bring along some folks on, on Charlotte FC's side with me to see it as well. But I went and showed fo uh, a couple of our, our club members the Vegas Golden Knights experience. Oh, yeah. And, you know, they're best, one best of the best. NHL. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the best in all of sports. And, again, I was like, who cares? Like, let's not just be like, what is the best soccer teams doing? And let's not just limit ourselves – to soccer. And, and one of the things that particularly um, I always appreciated about the golden Knights, for example, is you no know, hockey, no different than soccer. It's, it's, it's a traditional sport, hundred and yeah. something year, hundred plus years. There's tradition, your original six, there's, there's things you do and don't do in hockey. And, um, and one of the, the approaches that, that Vegas had was, um, you know, they're never going to disrespect the tradition of hockey, but they're going to do things the Vegas way. And, and they're, they bring out their culture. When you go to a game, you're never going to see any of that stuff anywhere else. And, and, and they don't care what anybody else says. The Flyers fans can come in and bitch and moan and, and Detroit and, you know, the Canadians can come in and say, this isn't what a hockey game is supposed to be like. 
they don't care in Vegas, right? This is Vegas. They're going to do it their way. They're going to make a show about it. They're going to make it a really unique experience and, and people love it and they show up and it's great hockey, but it's, it's incredible entertainment on top of that. So I really love that they leaned into who they were and didn't care what anybody else said. So, you know, that was something in terms of a mentality that we wanted to take as well. Like, let's just do cool stuff. I don't care as long as our fans love it and buy in. I do not care if Nashville fans have anything to say about it. Like we're, we're here to make sure that our fans love it and, and they buy in and to hell with everybody else. So, um, and, and we went and, um, you know, we went to a Kraken. It, that was a, a really cool experience. Oh, yeah. We went to their first, their inaugural game. So that was a really I watched it on TV. That was yeah. amazing. So, you know, a, 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 such a unique opportunity ahead of us launching where we got to see another club do the exact same thing that we were going to do months later to just learn from it, see how they approached an inaugural match. And, you know, I, I thought, um, I thought they missed in a lot of, in a lot of ways. And so that was kind of a learning, like, let's make sure that we make our inaugural match feel special, feel a little bit different, make it a big moment. Um, so, you know, that was, that was important to us to, again, we're not just trying to be the best. We want to be in soccer or in major league soccer, you know, taking ideas um, from everywhere. And, and that's where it's just an interesting dynamic with U S soccer supporters yeah. are so um, hell bent on, on just looking at soccer and, and labeling things as like, well, no, this has got to be soccer and it's got to be authentic and it's got to just be, you know, and I just want to do cool stuff. I don't care where the ideas come from. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand and relate to that. And when you were talking about Vegas and that mentality, I really do think as a fan base, we have embraced that sort of uh, culture where yeah. – we have the most insane march to the stadium outside of maybe LAFC. And even then we give them a run for their money. Uh, we have the TIFOs that are second to none in North America uh, and go toe to toe with some of the best clubs in Europe. We have the Poznan or the uh, Pepas as I call it. And that's an incredible tradition, which MLS is now using on all of their marketing to show yep. how passionate MLS fans are. So uh, the, you know, finishing the anthem, the whole stadium, uh, singing along that kind of stuff is incredible I love that we have those traditions but I, I do need to ask you uh, were you aware that Nashville invented playing music at sports games and that we were infringing on their copyright by doing that yeah I did hear that they invented the electric guitar uh, uh, yeah. that they have copyrights over it's very that serious uh, and and it's interesting because I actually I, I went uh to go see my beloved Lazio a few years ago. And, and, and I don't know, Na somebody should tell Nashville because they had a guitar at one of their matches <laughs> in Rome. Oh. Too, so it's international yeah. now, international crime. This is terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I wanted to kind of touch on the supporters thing too, because I think, or like the inaugural match and taking things from different uh, sports, I don't have a very a hockey background at all. I'm more of like a sec football type of background. And, the first match specifically, I remember vividly think, telling my wife, you know, because I'm a South Carolina Gamecocks fan. We, you know, it's SEC football. We're in the South. It's it's very big. And I remember looking at her and telling her, this, this to me rivals SEC football atmosphere, tailgate. And it, it was soccer. And you had the diversity of soccer with, you know, all kinds of different backgrounds. But it just, it, the, it was so electric and, so I just want to add to that. that I, I think that that's yeah. Well, think look, the tail tailgate is is a perfect example of that. You know, SEC Southern American yeah. football style. Like you're you're not going to see that. It, it's one of my favorite things to do, and um, I, I shared this with uh, with our with our club with our staff members at our club. You know, after our not after our home opener, but one of my favorite things is when we have big matches. So mm -hmm. our inaugural match, every home opener that we had, when, when we hosted Inter Miami, when we hosted Chelsea, you know, people from around the world come to those matches, and um, their the reception and their feedback afterwards. And these are people that cover the Premier League. I had um, had hosted uh, a couple guys from PFC Vintage. Uh, a vintage kit um, retailer all the way from Melbourne, Australia. And, and they came out and they were blown away by 
every element Mm -hmm. what our supporters did the tailgate the march the the show the intro video all of that they were like holy shit you know the way people talk about major league soccer abroad does it no justice to the reality particularly what we're able to do in charlotte and and you know i always take so much pride and and i love sharing what we have built um because it it is going to help you know the sport in this league grow but you know they were talking about the tailgate in particular and they were out there and they had their pop-up shop and that just blew them away and 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 i was like you know this is the coolest thing about this sport is that get every you get to build something based on the culture of your city and tailgating you know obviously the panthers are here there's tailgating college football like that is a very an american thing like Mm -hmm. you're not going to see that in europe and so right. that is really cool that you've been able to build that as fans and, and it be so unique to Charlotte and the U S but particularly our tailgating, because we've got all of our different supporter groups that come yeah. together. You know, they make it a, a family friendly, they've got bounce houses out there. Um, and so it, it truly is something really unique that we can be proud of. That's that, that is representative of the culture of, of Charlotte and the Carolinas. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I got maybe one or two more serious questions. And then if we have time, uh, I think Cole and I may have some suggestions that you can take back to the club from us. <laughs> cool. um, you got it. So it, during your time in Houston, did you ever come across a young Will Palachik with the radio station? Willie P. No, um, I, I, I think I you guys not. might have crossed over a little bit on the timeline. Maybe. He was a uh, he was a uh, radio, uh, I believe, a DJ in Houston before uh, he moved to Atlanta. And uh, we just spoke with him last week. And uh, that kind of uh, went off in my head about, you know, timelines might be crossing over a little. Yeah, we did not. Um, and 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 Will and I talk all the time. I, I love Willie P. Um, so no, that, that would have been incredible, though. <laughs> Well, I, I know you're an Italy supporter, but he was also in the American Outlaws. Shout out. Just any chance I can get to plug the American Outlaws. Um, so in terms of game day experience, we have the Copa America coming up. Uh, how involved is the Charlotte FC team in coordinating with CONCACAF or in this case, Canombo for for games? Um, Not not a ton. Uh, like, obviously, we, we, we worked on um, securing – the the event and the matches here and that's just a huge testament to to our fans and the city to be able to showcase this and and obviously when we host charlotte fc matches that that has put us on the map in terms of being a soccer city and an an international soccer city but you know outside of that like we really turn over the building to to them it's 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 now their event so Um, you know, we help execute and send out emails and, and obviously we, we provide our season ticket members with, you know, first access to tickets. But aside from that, it's, it's their event from the pricing to, you know, what it looks like in the building. So I'm not, um, super involved, you know, from, from what that match day experience looks like. Great. Cool. Uh, any last questions here? Yeah, well, not really any questions. Uh, I do know, obviously, that you're the host of Lazio World, correct? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And I am a Serie A supporter as well. I'm, a, I'm an Atalanta fan. Okay. Uh, who played today against Sporting and drew 1-1. Um, yeah, I hope you gave um, Eric Krakauer some some crap because he's a Sporting fan. <laughs> oh, is he? I didn't realize, uh, yeah, I didn't realize is, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's his we, childhood pop. So I think we're going to have him on soon. So we're yeah, yeah, going to give him that. some crap. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully Atalanta can pull that out. It's a one-one draw going back to Bergamo. Uh, and uh, did you watch the game? Any thoughts on it? I, I so I I had it on and I did not get to pay attention too much. I thought this was. Am I wrong in thinking this was the second leg? That was the first leg. I thought it was the first leg. I could be wrong. I mean, I I, I, I was barely, uh, but maybe maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe I just listened to to Crack Hour and I thought he said that but maybe it was the first leg. If so, then yeah. I mean, that's, that's a uh, one, one draw. I mean, that's a, that's a fine result. Um, Atalanta and Serie A has been really, really good. They've tripped up the yeah. past couple of weeks. Um, yeah. I need Atalanta to start losing some matches. I <laughs> hope they do well in, in European play. I, I will be actively rooting for them in European just because it helps the coefficient and, 
Um, said, yeah, right now is in position to earn a fifth uh, Champions League spot. But, um, but yeah, and I, I do need them to drop some games. I, I know Atalanta <laughs> has a big one this weekend against Juventus. So yes. I don't often find myself rooting for Juve, but um, unfortunately I will be this weekend. Yeah, so that I can confirm – um that we that, that was the first leg. It was so, the first leg, okay. Yeah, so it'll be it'll be one one going back to Bergamo next weekend. So. Okay. All well right. I'll I'll be rooting alongside you for that one. <laughs> well, uh thank you so much for joining us again. I want to respect your time, but I, I think we do have a few suggestions. Uh you mentioned the Golden Knights and the Kraken earlier. Uh how soon can we see a, a 3D animated uh pregame show on the field on the pitch? So um, it's coming this season, right? Come on. Uh, probably <laughs> not this season, and and those are quite quite expensive. Obviously, in in hockey, you have that beautiful ice that something can project on there, and and just it's a little bit more challenging with our surface. Um, we had looked at some stuff prior to the inaugural match that I wanted to pull off, um, but again, it just doesn't come off the same way as yeah. as it does. Um, and anything that you do like VR. Obviously, you're, you're going to be looking at the video board for some yeah. of that. And, and there's some stuff that we've done, like with the crown. But, the AR uh, crown. Yeah. yeah, but it doesn't doesn't have the same effect as when you're looking at some of that incredible stuff on the ice. No, my, um at the time, three-year-old did look at the screen and then looked down at the field and asked me where the crown was. He was yeah. really confused. Yeah. So like when the Panthers did the a few years yeah. back, they had their Panther that was pretty cool. Uh, running around, like right? It's, it's pretty cool. But, um, but a lot of times, like, it doesn't necessarily pop off the same way in – in the um, building versus like seeing it on TV or if you're looking at the video board. Okay. Another suggestion. Uh, we've had the flyovers. Uh, we have Minty waving the flag after the game. How about after a win, we skydive Minty into the stadium with a giant <laughs> W flag behind him. I will pass that along. Course. I love that one. Yeah. We've got to do it. Uh, Cole, any suggestions? No, nah, man. I, I think, uh, I think the Minty one is, is uh, it's something to say though. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm all for that. Maybe if we win MLS Cup, that's that one's a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Uh, well, hey, we appreciate everything you do. Uh, I know I've sent you some suggestions in the past, and I think it's a pretty high batting average for those suggestions turning into reality at one level or another. Uh, and you, you've always been uh, very professional, so keep up the great work. And uh, you know, if, if Celtic runs across Lazio again, obviously. We'll be on other sides. But until then, it's for the crown. <laughs> Absolutely. Appreciate it, Luke. Appreciate it, Cole. Yeah, yeah thanks, Sean. Thank okay. you.